and we're back with part two. Okay, so I was explaining the choke operation a little bit, or I started to. Um, there's a couple things about the factory choke. One is it is set, there's no adjustment. Uh, there used to be, once upon a time, an ability to adjust your choke. And there used to be lines that would be up here, and then your choke coil would have a little line on it, and you would line it up corresponding to either rich or lean, depending on what you needed the carburetor to do uh, when it was cold. Uh, once they started to get a little bit better with the chokes and the choke mechanisms, that stopped being a thing. Uh, and the factory choke setting is actually really good as long as it functions properly. Uh, a few things that you can do to verify that your choke is actually working. First would be to get in the car and look at the fuse box. If you're turning the key on and you're starting the engine and the indicator light in the center at the top for oil and choke is lit, the first thing you need to do is check that fuse. Uh, the reason for that is the oil pressure sending unit on these engines is responsible for sending power to the choke coil. So when you're testing for power, your engine also has to be running or you will not have 12 volts on this wire. Uh, <clears throat> As long as the fuse is good, and if you still have that light illuminated, you're likely going to need to check the connection at the oil pressure sender on the side of the engine, or the oil pressure sender itself is damaged and needs to be replaced. Uh, at that point, you should then be getting power with the engine running up to this pigtail. It's a, 12, it's a full 12 volts, uh, so if you don't have a voltage tester you can use a bulb in a socket with a couple wires on it as a uh, 12 volt indicator and you just simply ground one side to the engine and then test this wire lead with the engine running for 12 volts so as long as you have a good fuse the sending unit's working fine and you have 12 volts up to this there's no reason this shouldn't work unless the carburetor has come loose at the base nuts. Um, that'll cause a semi-ground issue which will cause the choke coil not to work very well. The other issue is the choke coil itself can burn up and go bad just like anything else. All it is is a bimetal spring on the other side of this thing. It gets 12 volts through here. The voltage goes through the bottom of this bimetal spring I'll show you on the other side of this. It then grounds through here, which grounds through the choke coil, which grounds through the carburetor, which grounds through the engine, which is why the carburetor being tight is the first step you need to check. Uh, not only to cure your vacuum leaks, but to see if your choke's working. Once you're satisfied that you actually have a good ground, and you have 12 volts, if this is not functioning, the first thing that you need to check would be that the choke coil's actually grounded through here and that would require a multimeter because you're going to need to check for continuity on all your grounds. Assuming that the choke coil is the problem, the factory screws, like I showed you in the first video, are broken off. They tighten to a certain torque and once they hit that point the head breaks off and it makes them tamper proof. What you then need to do is either cut a slot on top of them and run them out with a flat tip screwdriver or if they're really stubborn like these two were uh, you just take the heads off. You'll notice there are two sides to this and there's a tab here. The tab is on either side of this hole depending on which side I've got it flipped. That's the only adjustment you have in your choke and the reason for that is it lines up with here and it's technically not an adjustment. If you actually wanted to make this adjustable, you would have to grind that tab away. I don't recommend it. The factory settings are fine. But to get in here, you'll remove the heads of those screws or you'll pull the screws out. You pull this off. The side with the number at the top stamped in it is the side that the factory has facing out. And that's how this will go together. 
Now when you pull this apart, you want to make sure that you're very careful because there is a plastic bushing in here. This insulates the circuit. Let me get this out of here. This insulates the circuit from grounding out through the choke linkage rather than the body of the choke. Um, okay, I had to take a break for the screaming kiddo. Um, anyway, back to what I was saying. This little bushing right here uh, insulates the circuit from this bimetal spring. If this bimetal spring did not have this here, it contacts this, it contacts this lever right here. And instead of grounding through here, it ends up grounding through here and through the linkage. And so it loses ground, or if it does ground, it doesn't really do anything uh, because it'll move and it'll stop and it'll move and it'll stop. And because there's play, because this takes up a bunch of the slop, you then end up with a choke that's partly closed, even if this did function. Uh, you want this to get warm. If you're testing it, you can ground to the case right here and run 12 volts into the end of this pigtail. And you should watch the spring grow. Because as that gets hot, those two different metals expand at different rates. And that's how the spring works. It expands. And then as it cools back off, it's pulling, it's supposed to get to a point where once the engine's cold again, it pulls the choke closed. Uh, when you get in the car when it's first cold and you set the choke by pushing the throttle pedal once or twice, what you're doing when you go full throttle is you're releasing the little cam mechanism right here. And it allows the choke to go completely closed. And then as that warms up, this opens in a stepped amount on this screw until it's back to a slow idle and the choke's wide open. If you lose this, you're kind of screwed unless you got lucky and your carburetor kit came with one. Mine did, uh, but try not to lose that. A lot of people will get a new choke coil, they'll lose that, they'll stick it back on here, and then the choke doesn't work, or the choke only works about halfway, and they get mad and it ends up wired open like mine was. Uh, this is where it grounds. As you can see, this is pretty dirty. They get rusty. They lose their connectivity right here. Um, and then you don't have any choke that works. As you can see, it's been years since this choke has worked. The spiders managed to build a hole in it. Uh, I would show you how that works. How the vacuum pull-off works. But I'm going to... I'm not putting my mouth on that right now. So what I'm going to do is picture me putting vacuum on this. What this does is it pulls the lever open. So when it's cold out and the choke is still closed or it still needs to be closed and you need to give it a little throttle, when the vacuum pulls on this, it pulls the door open just a little bit so it'll rev. Um, that's what your choke pull-off is for. And you want to make sure that you're hose setup isn't rusted away like this one is and if it is clean this up real good and polish what you can and then shove a hose up farther on it and it'll still seal uh, worst case that's just press fit into there you can either grab a hold and wiggle it and pull it out and then insert a new one or just get a whole new end for this from a donor carburetor once you dig a little further into this and you've taken the ground ring off you're going to take the plastic part off and again you can see the spiders have been in here quite a bit and you can see where the choke pull off if this was to pull you can see where it would uh let me get the screw over here it comes over and it operates that only when there's vacuum there now, if the choke was completely open, it wouldn't matter because it would be over here and it wouldn't do anything. But when it's cold and you need to rev it, it still has to breathe. And if the choke slammed closed and you go to rev it and this doesn't open that choke door just ever so slightly, it'll fall on its face and it'll die. 
So that's how the choke pull-off operates. Some of them have two different vacuum ports. Some of them have a choke pull-off vacuum port and then another vacuum port over here that slows the operation. Uh, that's a lot of the, um, of the uh, emissions equipped cars have the second vacuum line for that. Uh, there's a timed port. They didn't want all of that operating when the car was really, really cold. Uh, so as things would operate up to temperature, there was a, a vacuum tree that had a thermic deal that would rise or fall depending on how warm the car was and it would allow different vacuum things to operate at different rates. And that was one of those things. <clears throat> on the back side of this, well, actually, let me stop here. When I take this out, when in the carb kit, there's a whole nother, you see it has a diaphragm on it because there's vacuum on these. Uh, make sure that you're replacing this. It just simply slides in there once this is undone. On the back side of these chokes, You'll notice that this has a couple springs in there. This should operate smoothly. If you're holding the cam and you operate this, you should be able to open it all the way and it should come back on its own. You notice the first couple times I did that, it didn't do that. And that's because of the dirt buildup in here. So you want to make sure you take the time to clean this all up. Another thing that happens is people get in here monkeying with these things and they bend the tabs. You see how this has got this weird angle to it right there? That should be straight. So I've either got to replace that from a donor carburetor or I have to straighten that out. But that's what operates the cam on here that rides on the fast idle screw. And you notice if I push on this, it opens the throttle blade a little bit. Well, when the choke is set and it's at fast idle, it cracks the throttle open just a little bit. And then as it starts to warm up, that five mil spring turns and moves that lever. And this ever so slightly starts to decrease until the throttle is at low idle and the choke is wide open. A lot of that doesn't ever get messed with. The factory sets that, the factory has the choke coil set, and if it doesn't work, it's almost always the electrical component or the ground that uh, off. So make sure you're checking the basics before you go throwing money at it. Uh, do know that if you're gonna dig into the choke, you're going to either need a choke kit handy uh, or a rebuild kit for the carburetor. And I'll tell you right now, if you've got to go as far as to rebuild the choke on this thing, you're also going to have to rebuild the carburetor. So you might as well just go ahead and get a full rebuild kit for it and go to town. Um, we're going to go over... Um, oh yeah, the vacuum operation. Not all carburetors have this, and if you noticed in the last video, this was sort of molded, uh, yeah, pulse, pulse to the carburetor like this. This is what they call a vacuum secondary carburetor. The secondary carburetor, the secondary barrel on the carburetor doesn't operate mechanically. What happens is it is locked out from operation until the primary is open. And then it, it lets it operate independently. And that operates off of that vacuum top right there. And it gets vacuum off of here. Vacuum, when, let's see, this is above the throttle plate, so this is timed vacuum. And what happens is when you crack the throttle open ever so slightly, instead of pulling vacuum down here, it now pulls vacuum above the throttle blades. And when you go full throttle, this vacuum port right here pulls vacuum on this. Whoops. And it pulls up in there, opening up your secondaries. To test this, you need to pull vacuum on it. 
you don't have to have a vacuum tester if you've got a clean vacuum line and you don't mind putting your mouth on it because you can just do this. It doesn't take much suction, you can see it moving. Okay, so we know the diaphragm isn't busted in that, and we know that operates. This here, you'll find on even the mechanical secondary carburetors, which I'll show you here in a second, the difference between these two. Uh, and this is a vacuum idle uh, pot. And what this does is, let's say the car is equipped with air conditioning or power steering. Anytime that you turn the wheel, the power steering pressure switch sees that you are turning the wheel and you have increased the pressure in the line. And it opens a vacuum circuit that pulls this open. And it presses down on this lever right here and it kicks the idle up just ever so slightly. Uh, same thing as if you have the air conditioning on, the very moment the air conditioner is on and engaged, that sees the same type of signal that it would from the power steering switch, and it engages the vacuum, and it allows this to idle it up just a little bit uh, to work against the drag that the air conditioner or the power steering pump would be pulling on the engine in a slow idle condition. Uh, and the same deal, you can pull vacuum on this, you can use a, a vacuum hand pump, or you can just simply put your mouth on it and pull like you're pulling on a straw. And it just comes out. Uh, that speed, that idle speed, is set by this screw right here. Um, there's a little e-clip that you have to pull off to take this pot off and then you have the three bolts here, here, and here that hold this whole assembly on. Uh, once you pull the e-clip in those three bolts and the vacuum line, it just comes off. Uh, this right here is now as disassembled as it needs to be for the next process uh, that we're gonna get into. And that is what the, uh, the boiling that we're gonna be doing. Um, we're going to get a pot of water and probably some simple green. Uh, and then we're going to dunk all of the submersible parts into a pot. And then we're going to crank it up on the little propane grill I've got out there. And we're going to boil this for a little while, probably about half an hour or so. And that should get pretty much all the junk out of this. And then we'll take uh, pressurized air or brake parts cleaner if you have it handy. And you're going to go through every single one of these passages. Um, a lot of these passages have stuff in them. I'll explain that here now. The jets, the air bleeds that I was talking about, uh, that I said that you want to make sure that you have them in the right side. When you pull these out up here, these are what's underneath of it. You'll unscrew these. just takes a large flat tip screwdriver that fits across the, the flats there. When you unscrew them and pull them out, these are down inside those holes. You can either turn the carburetor upside down and tap on it and sometimes they'll come out or sometimes you need to get a toothpick or something down in there and wiggle on it and then they'll pull up out of here. Okay. There's numbers on them. If you zoom in real close, sometimes you can see the... I doubt you're going to pick it up on the camera. But uh, trust me, there's little tiny numbers on these. Same thing with the air bleeds. Like this one says 140 on the top of it. I don't know if it's... Mm. Yeah, you can just barely see it popping up right there. So you make sure you got a magnifying glass if you don't have good eyes. This one says 140 on it. This one says 160 on it. Uh, same thing with the jets. They have numbers on them. And uh, you want to make sure that they go in the right homes. So record the numbers and which side they came out of. That way you know when you throw all this in the pot to boil it and you pull it all back out, it goes back in the right hole. That way everything's happy. Um, these, these jets just sit down in those little tiny wells down inside there and same deal. You want a screwdriver that fits all the way across both flats. That way you can get them out without chewing up the edge of the brass. 
Left the Lucy ready tidy, nothing really special about it. Uh, this is what I was talking about, was the pump squirter. When you pull this out of here, this is where it normally sits. And when you pull this out of here, you're going to pull the screw out. And then there's a washer, an aluminum ring washer right here. Okay, and then there's the squirter. And then under that is another washer, a spring, a very, very tiny spring, and that ball in the very bottom. The ball goes in the hole first, followed by the spring, followed by a washer, the squirter, another washer, and then the Phillips head screw, and you run it in till it's snug, and then give it probably another quarter turn, and that's all the tighter it needs to be. These, you should probably clean these out uh, by hand rather than throw these into the wash. You can throw the screw into the wash. Um, make sure you save the spring out. You don't want the spring in the wash. And the ball, there's a new one in the kit, so don't worry about the ball. The washer is the same thing. There's new washers in the kit. So this is the only thing that's going to go in with the carburetor when it gets boiled. Just make sure you take note of everything so you know where it all goes back. Same thing with, like I said, recording the numbers. That way you can just take all this and in there with the pot and boil it. Uh, I'm going to boil this just to clean it up. Just to get all the junk out of the inside of this. This thing is stuck. I don't have another one to replace it with. And it doesn't matter because I'm running it unhooked anyway. So it just needs to fill the hole in the bottom. I will be replacing the o-ring on it that's in the carburetor kit. Um, however, uh, this is just going to get boiled. That way uh, I have a way to seal it. The top, when you take the top apart, you do not have to take the butterfly out, but do go ahead and take the throttle or the, the um, blade linkage out and the plastic out and the little bit that's in here that fills that hole, uh, take that out. This one didn't have one, so I'll be putting the one from the kit in it. Uh, also, go ahead and take your needle and seat out of the top. That'll include the O-ring that's at the bottom of it, or the washer, rather. And then this here was the bit that you saw right here. And this is the bowl vent. There's a little E-clip that holds it on, on this side. Once you remove the E-clip, you can remove this black piece. And then on the other side, it'll sit in there like this. And there's a spring in between here and here. Or, no, I'm sorry, in between here and the black part. So don't lose the spring. That holds it down. And that's underneath this. There's just three screws that hold it down. This comes off. And then once you pop that E-clip off, this whole assembly comes out. I just reassemble it. The parts are in the kit to put new ones in there. This just lets me know where all the parts go and reminds me that I need to put the spring and things back in their home. This is now, after pulling the fuel filter housing out and the fuel filter spring out, also ready to go be boiled. Uh, this is pretty, uh, this is pretty simple to lose. Do not lose it. This is the spring that goes in behind the fuel filter every time the fuel filter gets changed on these. It seems like this gets lost. And when it does, the fuel filter just sits in there and does this. And the fuel really just rushes around it and doesn't do anything. You want it to go through the hole and out of the filter material and then into the carburetor. So, that aside, this housing has a new ring in the kit, but the housing can be boiled. And then here's that accelerator pump cover I was talking about with the throttle position sensor in it. This is what uh, operates the sensor. Just like any other throttle position sensor GM has used, uh, it's just a three wire deal. Uh, and this is all the computer needed to see. And it really doesn't have a whole whole lot of a bearing on how the car runs, honestly. But this part does. 
and you want to make sure that the arm is functioning, the arm isn't all bound up, uh, go ahead and clean it. You can take the throttle position sensor out of here if you want to keep it and then boil this entire set, entire thing once the electronic bits are out uh, or if you're in the process of changing it over to the one that doesn't have this same deal you just clean up your cover and get it ready uh, you're going to be replacing your float with a brand new one they're cheap don't cheap out there um, your accelerator pump this is the spring I was talking about it fits on the inside of the accelerator pump the small side has a round bit in there that it locates on. That keeps it centered. You'll install the spring. Well, if we were putting this together, we would install the spring between the diaphragm and then we shove the diaphragm down and then we put the cover on and we run the screws in. And that's all there is to it. If you were servicing it on the car, be the same deal just don't lose the spring because obviously if this is on the engine it's going to fall out and hit the ground and you'll never find that and you don't get that spring in the kit so uh one other thing that you want to do before you throw this in the bath you don't have to worry about disassembling any of this that's going to be fine it's going to clean up however for the first time you're going to need to tune this past what the factory had it set up and you're going to need access to the curb idle mixture screws or screw rather and that's under this cover uh, they blocked it off because they didn't want you mixing with it because the factory had it set where the factory needed it to pass emissions uh, the problem is it's a little bit too lean these days to run properly and they really all need just a little bump and adjustment but when you rebuild this and you set it all up, when you're going to tune this, you absolutely will need to uh, turn that screw. And to access that, they gave you this little area where you will insert a cold chisel at a sharp, sharp angle in here, and you're going to strike it, and it's going to break that area off, which will let that plug come out. That allows you access to that screw that's underneath there that you're going to need to adjust. So once we get this out of the bath, uh, we'll come back to this for part three, where I'll go over reassembling this and uh, the order of operations for making sure everything is tight as it should be, how everything should operate once it's reassembled, um, and then we'll go on to putting it on the car and setting it up. All right, real quickly before I do take off here, this is a mechanical secondary carburetor that would have had the, um, had another vacuum deal here. But when you operate this, if you notice, once the primary gets to a point where it contacts that cam, it will pull the secondary open. Uh, this is a much preferred carburetor setup over the vacuum secondary on these little engines they like a snappy carburetor but uh, a lot of the automatic cars came with a vacuum secondary and that was to slow it down so you didn't have to fight the torque converter as hard when it was coming up into RPM um, but these work just as good this is the main difference between this carburetor and this setup on this carburetor is it doesn't have the extra vacuum pot for the secondary because it's So, given that, once we get this in the bath, oh, I will get uh, back on this and then uh, we'll get to tuning it. So, stay tuned. And that concludes part two. Uh, we're going to get this thing into the cleaner. I'm going to get it boiling and then uh, I'll see you guys for part three.